Castle Morihisa is Smoking Bear Studios and Thermite Games' newest release on the Nintendo Switch. This roguelike strategic deck builder is not shy about its inspiration from Slay the Spire while still trying to present and add a couple of brand new layers to the experience that might make players take some time to adjust. With that said, once everything begins to click, the roguelike mechanics, intuitive UI, and pretty simple and fresh presentation will keep you wanting to play just one more round. Now at first glance this game is taking a lot of inspirations from of course Lay the Spire and that's the right place to do so. That is one of the best games that this genre has to offer. And what this game is trying to do is add a couple of brand new layers and interesting tweaks that will make the experience just a little bit more deeper and not a little bit engaging while still giving it its very own flavor. Now sadly when it comes to the story there's really not much to say here. Each one of the characters has some flavor in text and I guess a reasoning as to why they are doing this exploration and trying to engage with monsters but ultimately this is not going to be the reason why you're going to be playing this game and you shouldn't be necessarily too concerned about it. So to start out you have four characters to choose from but originally there are only going to be two of them unlocked in order for you to be able to unlock the samurai and the ninja these are the other two classes aside from the monk and the Omyoji, you're going to need to be able to beat the game with each one of those classes first in order to be able to unlock the other two separately. Now as is also expected, each one of the characters has their very own sets of cards. Each one of them has their subtypes for each one of the cards as well. And also boosts and buffs that are going to make each one of the characters stand out in their very own way. Now sadly none of this is actually explained when you're choosing a character so basically when you stand out if you're choosing the monk you should basically know that he's going to have a lot of like defensive boosting abilities a lot of cards that are going to be able to give you a chance to gain more defense and the omyoji is a little bit of a caster type they can sacrifice health for a little bit more damage and they can summon spirits that are going to be able to give them a little bit of either extra damage extra defense uh, regen for extra heals and stuff like that. Now when you start any single run there's two things you're going to quickly notice. First and foremost you're going to notice that the shop is instantly available to you at all times except when in battle. And secondly you're going to have another tab I believe the R button is going to show you the talents information. And this one is extremely interesting because ultimately what you have here is this fear like think of like Final Fantasy X that every time you spend more action points on it you're going to be able to pick up passive boosters. These passive boosters are only tied specifically to one character. They're not going to be able to be changing from one character to another. So each one of them are extremely different. Within that sphere, there's four different tiers. The outer tier is going to be the more expensive one. I believe it's like eight talent points or whatever it is. Middle is five. The one underneath that is three. And the first one is one. The more talents you get, the more you're going to be able to want to expand on these brand new talents that you're going to be picking up. These are going to give you different passives for each one of the characters. I'm not going to be going over them because there's just so many of them for each one of the characters. But essentially what you want to do here is based on the idea that you want to build your deck around, that's the abilities you're certainly going to find a couple that are going to benefit you the most. And then you're going to, you know, fill out the rest with whatever you might actually need. Now the other big change that I also mentioned was the fact that the shop is there at all times. Here you're going to of course going to be able to purchase cards. You're going to be able to actually spend points to buy more talents. You're going to be able to purchase cards and of course other cards that are actually called items. These are mostly one use items for the most part and they have like this very unique mechanic where like unlike most cards that go to the void for that specific battle and then you can't use them again. These are one uses only. These are extremely valuable. They're kind of cheap to be interestingly enough and on top of that you're just going to be able to use them one and they disappear altogether. Then of course you're going to be able to refresh the shop and be able to have the option to purchase multiple cards as well uh, if you have the money which is like one of those things that I definitely have a criticism of that the game doesn't necessarily give you that many coins but you know it's all about choosing where you want to spend your money appropriately for the deck that you're trying to build. Now the last interesting mechanic here that is worth mentioning as well as you're about to start any engagement is the fact that you're going to be able to select a hero and these are essentially names of like fallen warriors and each one of these fallen warriors is going to have some type of boost or benefit. Think of it like the well but actually more meaningful and these you're going to be able to pick up ultimately four once you get to the end of a run if you kind of did all the parameters you needed to do. And on top of that, these are going to be like limited uses. So they're not going to be there infinitely. For example, if you find one that says 
earn 20 more armor in this turn that's only going to be limited for a certain amount of like uses and then it's just going to go away you're never going to be able to use it again so it's one of those benefits you're also going to have but you need to know when to use it as well and of course these are also supplemented by the fact that you're going to be finding artifacts throughout your experience throughout your run so you're also going to be able to get those artifacts that are going to give you another set of passive boosters and passive abilities whenever you need them now breaking down combat is going to be pretty much exactly what you would have expected at the beginning of every single run you're going to start out with three energy every turn you're going to have your armor that you're going to want to use to be able to defend yourself from incoming damage and of course you're going to have your attack cards to be able to just dish out damage as best as possible when it comes to card types of course you have attack cards you have your defense cards you also have the item cards that i mentioned earlier these are more healing ones that you're going to be using for one use only most of them not all of them and then you also have traits uh, which are pretty much like passive booster specifically for that one turn or maybe just that one engagement but they like are going to cost you energy specifically so you need to make sure that you save those for a very specific situation or i guess more specifically based on the deck you're trying to build now as you're fighting monsters you're going to be able to see of course underneath their health bar you're going to be able to see the debuffs that they have on them and with the right thumbstick you should be able to move it around and see what type of debuffs they have what type of boost they have as well same thing for your warrior you're going to be able to see all of that one of my biggest issues with this game is that while intuitive and something that you've seen before from games of this type of course lay the spire being one of the main ones is the fact that even for newcomers or players like me who have put thousands of hours on that game how we're still having a little bit of an issue trying to understand some of the mechanics that the cards are trying to present of course early on you just simply have the basic ones but once you get into more intuitive ones especially with the omnioji that second character you're going to be like learning some different things that it does a little bit differently that ultimately like you're sacrificing health in order to be able to get health back but at the same time you're also causing debuffs and buffs for yourself and it's just a lot of layers from one specific turn that you really need to pay attention on and all those little like tabs underneath the monster or you or even the card descriptions the box on the side they're all in the same color they're all the same text and i wish that would have been basically just color coded a little bit better so we have a better understanding as to what boosts are like for what and what they do and they have a specific color and those kind of things just make it a little bit easier already cards have those type of descriptors blue means defense red means attack yellow means like boosters green means health all those things are pretty self-explanatory but when it comes to like the actual meaning of those boosts that they do they're not necessarily all that clear with that said, instead of going up a tower like you typically would in the other game, here you're going to be exploring uh, pretty much a sideways map. You're going to be exploring one way to another. Sometimes you'll have more than three choices. Sometimes there'll be a fourth choice. Uh, you'll be able to like battle monsters, have an event, go into a tent to be able to rest. Sometimes you have a sub boss before you finally get to a boss, which believe me, getting to the first boss is going to be a long trek, especially if you don't necessarily understand the mechanics. And the soft bosses aren't necessarily all that challenging but ultimately you definitely want to be able to take them down because you're going to get more coins you're going to get more talents and of course you're going to be able to pick up more cards from them of course you're also going to be picking up cards from whenever you take down any of the monsters you're going to have a choice to pick up from three different cards and if you're lucky enough you might find an artifact that actually gives you the choice to be able to pick up an extra card or two at the end of each match now the last brand new mechanic this game introduces is the fact that once you finish a boss battle or a mini boss you're going to have the chance to be able to pick up a quest scroll and these are pretty self-explanatory they're basically going to tell you like hey if you do a battle and you do like all three attacks in a row in one turn you're going to be able to gain like 10 more health but then there's going to be another one that are like really simple like hey if you don't take any damage in an entire battle every single card in your deck is going to be upgraded automatically remember that you can also go to the smithy and be able to like upgrade your cards that's also a choice here that's kind of a given but then you have a scroll that like so powerful that basically says as long as you mitigate all the damage in one battle it doesn't have to be a boss it doesn't have to be a sub boss it could be any trash mob if you just simply mitigate damage and avoid taking damage you're automatically automatically going to upgrade all of your cards like i came across one of those and i instantly picked it up and the next three fights that i had i was just so desperately trying to defend and i ultimately ended up getting it so it's one of those things where like these scrolls can be like really really important to pick up on any given run 
but I've only ever seen them drop once in an event, which again, those are kind of random by RNG. And secondly, I think they're mostly guaranteed if you are doing mini bosses. So you definitely have a much bigger incentive, not necessarily to take it down for the rewards, because of course, bosses are gonna give you good rewards, but for that quest scroll, you definitely wanna give it a chance to take down those mini bosses. Now, of course, that brings you the danger of losing a lot of health. Sub bosses can be a little challenging depending on your deck, so it really goes without saying that. They are really trying in this game to give you some sort of new incentives to take on some of the challenges that most people have kind of already gotten used to avoiding. I guess it is worth mentioning that the art isn't necessarily all that there. Like I mentioned before with the HUD, like the HUD is great, the UI is good, but there's some clarification that needs to be done there with coloring of text to make it a little bit more legible for newcomers. And I think that, again, the visuals for these games are not necessarily all that much of an issue on the nintendo switch the game runs extremely smoothly i've not found any issues whatsoever i do want to say that the loading times are a little bit iffy i have been playing a lot of ps5 games though recently so that's just me but other than that you know the loading times might be one of the things that you might complain about but other than that the game runs extremely well Castle Morihisa is a first attempt at something that we've already kind of understand what the formula is supposed to be and they really needed to nail it right out of the gate and I think they get there for the most part although there are some issues for the game at the end of the day no game is perfect and this game will definitely give fans of roguelike deck builders a whole heck of a lot of time to invest and new mechanics to learn. Nintendo Sphere Kids Castle of Morihisa on the Nintendo Switch a 7.5 out of 10. If you're brand new to my channel, be sure to leave a like and subscribe, hit the bell to receive notifications when the videos go up, and as always, thank you so much for watching. See ya.